They're calling this a big victory for Obama with his latest long form. Uh, and he may have been born in Hawaii. The point is they've been covering something up for two years, and, 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 and that birth certificate has been altered. Probably on purpose to keep it on this debate instead of his real record, which they don't want people to look at. Meanwhile, Obama's approval rating remains at all-time low for second week in a row, says Gallup, despite the latest stunt. Uh, also, Washington Times reports birth certificate isn't Obama's only secret. The White House is still saying we're not going to release his college, any of the rest of it, big cover-ups uh, going on on that front. That is just some of what we're going to be discussing and the economic news today with uh, economist Webster Tarpley, also historian. Economic growth slow as inflation measures uh, spikes up. Uh, that is just some of what we're going to be breaking down. But it's funny. Tarpley got here about 12 minutes ago or so during the break. Uh, and I said, Tarpley, what do you want to talk about today? And he said, first, I want to... It's great to have him here in studio with us. He said, first, I want to talk about this spectacle, the royal wedding. And I said, absolutely, that was my first issue. And I said, what are we talking about second? Well, the birth certificate, exactly as I, of the same mind. Uh, and then we'll get into the economy and Libya and Fukushima and all of it uh, with him for the full next hour. Then Dr. Bob Bowman will be in studio with us. Uh, and Tarpley's here to be interviewed for a, a documentary film on the Tea Party and how they've co-opted the left with Obama, now the right with the co-opted Tea Party that they claim was founded by Sarah Palin and Glenn Beck when it was founded almost four years ago by 9-11 Truth and then picked up by Ron Paul three and a half years ago. And some media does admit uh, the truth of that, uh, but it's interesting to understand how the globalists are trying to control the left-right populist awakening uh, that's happening. So we'll cover that full spectrum. But I put out a video two days ago that's got, had over 200,000 uh, uh, views and has been picked up by the London Telegraph and others. Uh, basically, uh, you know, they're raising the alarm like body snatchers, hissing at me that I'm not a royalist. Uh, and uh, that I dare say the spirit of America is about not being entitled, these hereditary kings, uh, these German usurpers of England. No, I'm not saying Germans are bad folks. I'm part German. The point is they are usurpers. I'm not over in Germany, you know, claiming I'm the king there, uh, you know, from Texas. And people are like, well, why are you covering the royal wedding? It's pop. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a diversion. Yes, we're covering it and illustrating that, and that they create these, these Bernaysian, sycophantic events like they're celebrities, and they have all the celebrities there bowing and kowtowing to create the illusion this is something wonderful and valuable while saying, oh, they're ceremonial, they have no power, when it's the opposite. And I see Canadians, British, other Commonwealth holdings in denial that she declares war. Uh, that, that, that she can uh, have whole tribes kicked off islands for U.S. military bases, that, that, that when I was in London last, they, they were announcing that they did a tour bus, well, the queen has closed these roads today. She, she, she does that to let us know she owns them and that she owns half the country and doesn't allow billboards nationally and shuts the Thames occasionally to exercise power. And Canada, three times in the last year, she suspended parliament through her governor general. And folks say, oh, that's just... That's just titular. That's just uh, vestigial. That's just ceremonial. That's just blah, 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 blah. No, it's not. I've read the governor general agreements. But we have a historian, an expert, uh, who has a doctorate uh, in, 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 in the whole Venetian system into the British Empire on this specific subject. So for all of you Brits and others who are in denial about this, uh, here is the Times of London. Islanders accuse Queen of illegal eviction. And they go and admit six years ago and Diego Garcia kicking the giant NATO population off so that it could be a secretive B-52 uh, reloading weapons base to menace the Middle East. I mean, I mean, here's the Times of London. Stop living in denial. OK, stop it. OK, they have the parliament with its two houses, the House of Lords and the parliament. And then they've got the queen and she her 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 queen's speech sets the agenda. They're the ones that want the eugenics on record. They had the Royal Population Commission in 49 that was cited as U.S. policy and State Department memorandum 273. Well, I'm, I'm ranting. Webster, the rest of this segment, the next segment, let's focus on the royal wedding, break it down, the true power, what the spectacle is all about. Webster, Griffin, Tarpley, uh, good to have you here. Thank, thank you very much, Alex, and thank, thank you for your, uh, your spirit, right? the righteous indignation against this, this monstrosity. Uh, certainly, if you look at uh, what these American networks have done with this uh, event, 
I think this is really a revolting spectacle. Uh, once Queen Elizabeth was asked about what, what her ideology was, and her answer was, we are older than capitalism and socialism. And it's true, because what she represents is feudalism. This is a feudal or neo-feudal degenerate uh, that, uh, that heads up this family. Now, she's not an absolute monarch. This is an oligarchical monarchy. But the power of the monarch within the oligarchy is is very considerable, as as you've been. Uh, well, it's also they're all intermarried. It's hereditary. It's a, it's a gang. It's right. it's like the La Cosa Nostra. Uh, maybe we just give give some examples. I think if you wanted to look at this, do a short summary. You could organize it around themes like insanity, in other words, mental degeneracy, which they have very very heavily, and then support for genocide. Um, take some because inbreeding, even with the Egyptians, you know, a lot of their folks only lived <laughs> at age five or so. I mean. Uh, I mean, inbreeding causes... It says, Dieu et mon droit, and it, that Dieu et mon droit means incest is fine as long as you keep it in the family. Uh, George III was stark raving mad, the tyrant. Queen Victoria, uh, for the last 40 years of her life, was a recluse who ran a death cult around her dead husband, Prince Albert, and she had seers, occultists, apparitionists, Ouija boards... Uh, Same thing with Tony Blair. That's where this starts. Well, poor Tony, uh, one of the things we have today is that this was a hard right turn by the monarchy today because neither of the two Labor Party guys, not Tony Blair and not Gordon Brown, were invited today. So this is, this is really one of the most important political... Well, Webster, I'm relishing this. Stay there. We'll be right back to, to break down this disgusting spectacle. Webster, you've got the floor. Start breaking down why this royal wedding is so abhorrent. People say, well, just ignore it if it's bad. No, uh, this is how they're selling themselves as a propaganda ploy to the world. It's an exercise in brainwashing the American people on a pretty vast scale. Uh, again, George III was stark raving mad. There was even a movie about that some years ago. Victoria spent 40 years of her life as a recluse, practically never going outside, she lived in Balmoral Castle. Some years ago, the prescription records of the local pharmacy were found. She was an opium addict in the form of laudanum, which was a tincture, a solution of opium in, in, uh, in alcohol that they would, they would use. And she was known as Mrs. John Brown because she spent all of her time with this Scottish, um, well, rustic, right, who lived there. And um, he basically had the adjoining bedroom. So that was Mrs. John, John Brown. Um, other examples would be, uh, you look at uh, Prince Philip, right? He wants to come back reincarnated as a deadly virus to kill people and solve the problem of overpopulation in the world. I mean, that's, that statement goes beyond anything Hitler ever said in public, right? That you want to kill people for the, for the purpose of lowering the population. Prince Charles, right? The father of the groom. What's with him? He says he talks to plants. All right, fine, anybody can talk to plants. But then he added, and they answer me. <laughs> so when the plants start answering you, then you know that you're, you're pretty much in, uh, in trouble. Um, but we know medically that inbreeding, uh, it, it doesn't just cause deformities. It always causes insanity, megalomania. Uh, and here is an inbred group of megalomaniacs in these 17th century commander outfits festooned with medals with women all over the world buying teacups and throwing flowers at them. This is like right. groveling at, 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 at the feet of a cesspit. It's like bathing in, in, in maggot uh, uh, leavings. <laughs> Yes. Well said. Uh, the great, great, great uncle of the pair, right, the couple who got married today, was Prince Albert Victor Edward, known as Prince Eddie. And according to most historians, he is the main suspect of being Jack the Ripper. Yes. Uh, and not that he was necessarily insane to start with. Well, syphilis. He Syphilitic. Syphilis, and he probably died of syphilis. Ripping scrofula. Um, okay. Um, but apart from this now, the, the, um, the, the insanity is one thing, but then this, this affinity for Nazism and the affinity for, for genocide. Now, the, the key guy, of course, is King Edward VIII, who was a close personal friend of Hitler. This is about 1936, right? He was forced out very soon. When the war started, he had to run out through Portugal. He was busy groveling at Hitler's feet. He was a volunteer to Hitler to become the viceroy 
of a Nazi puppet state in Great Britain, if Hitler had conquered the British Isles, he would have come forward and say, make me the, in effect, the king. He'd be the British uh, equivalent of a Vichy. Of Marshal Pétain. He would have been the Marshal Pétain, except he would have said, I'm a member of the royal family. And when you think about it, that would have meant that Nazism would have come into Canada and into Australia and into New Zealand because of the way the British... And it would have Empire gotten the was. British intelligence network. Hitler would have won at that point. Hitler would have gotten a foothold in the North American continent. In the, in no, the Hitler linked up with the British Empire would have been unstoppable. And, but Don't you agree? Been, yes. Well, it would have been a very grave thing. But it, it would have it meant that a lot of institutions in the empire, a lot of United Empire loyalists would have immediately said, well, if the king is Edward and he's supporting Hitler, then we have to support Hitler, too. So that's that's very Because Hitler was a rock star at that time. The entire history of this British oligarchy, I mean, it's not just... Well, let's continue. Back in one minute, just, uh, let's continue, uh, Webster, because I'm, I want to finish up with some of the history and then get to this current spectacle. Now, they have to hide most of the royals because they're so mentally ill and deformed. They trot out the few that can actually talk. Doctor of History, economist, Webster Riven Tarpley is our guest for the rest of the hour. The Dr. Bob Bowman's coming in. I'm tempted for a segment or two to have these two in here together. That'd be a... Very interesting event. The last time we had that was when they were on C-SPAN at my 9-11 event in 2006 that had such a big effect. Webster, you were going through some of the history of these people we worship in this short segment. When we come back, I want to look at the real power they wield, suspending parliaments, kicking natives off islands, mm -hmm. uh, funding genocide, a really nasty lot. But she's such a sweet old lady. Yeah, the the the, the history of it, of course, is, is something quite different. Um, if you wanted to focus on one person in the entire thousand-year history of the British monarchy, right, going back to William the Conqueror in 1066, it would probably be King Edward VII. Now, he was king, formally speaking, pretty much in the first decade of the, of the, of the 20th century. So about 100 years ago, he died. So he'd been in power from about 1900 to 1909 or 1910. However, since Victoria had been this recluse for 40 years, he was, in effect, the acting king. And this is the one case where the monarch coincides with the leader of the oligarchy. In other words, he combined both posts. Sometimes you'll have the monarch as some weak figure, and the oligarchy has a different leader. But King Edward VII has got both of these. A things. real tyrannous. Not exactly a tyrannous. Again, it's an oligarchical system. It's not a French style, you know, Louis the Fourteenth absolute monarchy or something like this. It's a doge, right? He's like a doge, but a Venice. But he's if he can lead the oligarchy. And what he did, this is the person who basically organized most of the historical tragedies from about 1860 until until his death. And World War One is really his handiwork. Uh, Edward the Seventh is the guy who created the Triple Entente. In other words, Britain, France, and Russia against Germany. The encirclement of Germany. And they started the hype that the rise of Germany is a threat. Exactly. They didn't even mince words. They said they're too economically powerful, too many scientists, too many patents. We've got to start a war with them. Right. And this, is a, this, this can teach us a lot about our current period because the, the U.S.-China relationship today is a, is a kind of an echo of the British-German relationship uh, at the time, and of course that, le that led to a world war. So he set up this alliance system, right, this idea that in, in 1914 when something happened in Europe, the only thing that was possible was if France started to mobilize, then everybody else had to mobilize, and once everybody started to mobilize, then war was a foregone conclusion. So Edward VII is, is somebody who set that up. He made a trip to uh, North America, the first uh, visit by a, 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 at least the Prince of Wales to North America in 1860. It's thought that he helped get the American Civil War going. He did uh, a number of, of things like this. So Edward VII, you'd have to say, is the indispensable person for causing World War I. Out of World War I comes World War II, pretty much directly, Nazism, Communism, eventually the Cold War. The entire pattern of world history since Edward VII has been shaped as a tragedy, right, as a catastrophe. It's all uh, orbiting this creature. Yeah, he's, he's, he is considered their greatest activist, right? In other words, their, their most successful political guy since William the Conqueror would be, would be Edward VII. All right, we, we mentioned Edward VIII as a, uh, as a Nazi, and this he clearly was. Of course, not just him. There was a whole faction in the House of Lords, the so-called Cliftonstadt. It's written Cliveden, but Cliftonstadt 
Uh, this is Lady Astor, Lord Astor, a whole group of dukes and lords and others who were all pro-Hitler. And this is the group that supported uh, Chamberlain, right, the appeasement, so-called appeasement policy, which was really just the support of Hitler. And did they learn anything from this stuff, right? A after 1945, you could say, well, you know, they were fooled by Hitler, many were fooled by Hitler.